but any sort of ailment that's physical related. Um, and we've been doing so for years. We've, we've implemented these four pillars and found that, that they get a better result and, uh, and get a faster result. And so what we've done is we've combined a few different specialties together. Now, what we're gonna talk about today is, well, okay, so the content I'm gonna put up over here differs from the picture. This, nobody wants this. You don't wanna wake up and see that. That'd be kind of scary. But, but this, the talk is for you if you've got severe back pain and you're trying to avoid surgery. Or if you don't have severe back pain, you've got a mild ache and you're trying to prevent it from becoming something worse. And then uh, lastly, and probably most commonly seen, if we get people that have back pain, they come in simply because they can't do some of the things they were doing before. They want to get back in life and start being active again. And they found, uh, I'll be quite honest, it's it, it mainly golfers more than anything else. You know, golfers, it, it, these guys that come in, if anybody's a golfer here, I'm not knocking you, I think it's great, I'll probably do it one day when I have more time. But um, a golfer can have the worst pain in the world and they can be limping, but if they can't swing that club, man, they are in the office. So um, my hat goes off to those guys. Uh, so what we'll talk about today is two different things. We'll discover the, what those four steps uh, do and how mixing different specialties yields a good result. We'll talk a little bit about how regenerative medicine works and how spinal decompression gets good results. And then also why pain management and physical therapy go together. I do have to say a um, little disclaimer though, when I'm talking about pain management, I don't mean uh, injections or oxycodone. I mean the opposite. I mean truly managing your pain in a more natural way. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about lumbar supports as well. And then lastly, we'll talk about how we can avoid back surgery. But um, I do have to make a you know, quick disclaimer. Obviously, surgery is truly needed in some patients. The problem, and we send out for it. We send out, uh, oh gosh, twice yesterday. That's not, not, a, not a good day. I hate to send people out for, uh, they were both knees, unfortunately. Um, they both needed arthroscopy done. But um, it's, that's not the, the most common day for us. Usually, typically, people come in, we're able to help them and get them uh, to a point where they feel better without surgery. But it's unfortunate how many people do get surgery that don't need it. And it's an extremely high percentage. So what I'll do is I'll start with my story on back pain. It tells me because of the hulking muscles, looks kind of similar. So um, I actually did hurt myself in the gym, believe it or not. So this guy's got these little weights. I swear they were a little bit bigger than that. But, um, <laughs> but I, I had them on the ground, and I was going to pick them up, and I don't know what I was going to do with them, but I was going to do something. So um, I got to about right here, and my knee was grinding, and I was training for a race. So I thought, well, I'm not going to hurt my knee. I'll, I'll just straighten my knee up and use my back. So I got about halfway up, and I got stuck, of course. So what do you think I did? Do you think I just put the weights down and said, oh, that's not a good idea, I'll lift one at a time? No, no. no. of course no. not. Because I'm a guy, of course I don't not. think. So I got about halfway up, and I just pushed it all the way up. Everything was great. I said, wow. And in my guy brain, I said, that was a good idea. <laughs> so about an hour later after my workout, I took like a 20 minute ride in the car between the gym and where we used to run. My wife took off and I got about five steps in and my back was killing me. It was horrible. So um, just to paint this picture, my, my best friend's parents had their, their 40th that evening. I had to go hang out with them and we all, they had like a whole big party and so I, I was there till about 11. By the end of the night, I had so much spasm in my back that I couldn't get my heel on the ground. My, my hip had, had come up and it was horrible. I ended up, um, when do you feel bad? That day or is it the next morning that's worse? Next morning. Next morning, right? Oh yeah, next morning I, I went to get out of bed and I, I don't know if anybody else has done this, probably have if you're here for the store. But I lay on my stomach, slid my, my legs off the bed because I couldn't, I couldn't sit up. And, uh, and then I, I pushed myself up in the nightstand. And uh, it was miserable, but eventually um, I ended up getting adjusted, uh, ended up talking to a physical therapist. I got some exercises, it helped. So that was in 03. That's when I, I started this whole thing. In 2010, I did it again, but I did it worse. This time I find myself not just doing PT and chiropractic, I found myself talking to an ortho. And he's saying, oh, I can shave that off, don't worry about it, we'll get you fixed up in no time but that's not the route I wanted to go. I was trying to avoid the surgery. So I started my, my, my search for more natural methods and that's kind of what I've implemented throughout the years. And uh, in, in my case, it kept me out of surgery. But some of those newer techniques that came about has uh, not just helped me, but it's helped 
uh, multiple other patients along the way, and it's helped us take care of people and get them out of pain without getting cut off. So that was really our goal. Now, when we look at typical treatments in the typical office, uh, it looks kind of like this. And, and let me just explain real quick. Um, yes, I'm a chiropractor. We have a, an MD in the office and uh, a nurse practitioner and then a rehab person. So we have uh, different approaches. You know, we've got medical, chiro, and rehab. Everybody thinks they're right all the time. Trust me, I, I've always thought that. But, uh, but I found that combining different specialties yields a faster result and a better result long term. And that's really why we've implemented that, because we've been able to get people better faster and then with more, uh, more efficacy as far as uh, our success rate has now gone up into the 90s as opposed to being down in the 70s and 80s. Um, so instead of just addressing symptoms, and that's typically what we see in, in most offices, uh, by taking meds or prescribing meds or doing injections of cortisone, we do have cortisone in the office. It's not our go-to. It's something we do periodically if need be. But the primary approach is to do something more natural. So we utilize a product called Serapin. It's, uh, it's from the pitcher plant. It's an a anti-inflammatory that's natural. Uh, Big Pharma won't pick it up because it can't be, uh, it can't be uh, something that they can protect. Um, and so we utilize products like that that seem to get really good results. Uh, physical therapy often doesn't really do a great job of controlling acute pain, so we have some other methods for that. We also address joint fixation and muscle adhesions or fixation. Those are two really big um, things that get missed most often. And joint adhesions, what do you call those things that you feel in your, in your traps, let's say? It's like a knot back there, but we call those things. Yeah, that one. Thanks, yeah. All right, so anybody in the ring who spoke up, we're gonna have you guys be silent for the rest of the seminar, thanks. Um, but yeah, yeah, so nods or trigger points. You guys heard that term, right? Yeah. So trigger points, it's, it's, it's a tight, balled up, um, not a muscle that's in spasm, but just a small area of it. And those trigger points occur from abnormal posture over time. So let's say, for example, if I, I get an injury and I hurt my low back, let's say I fall down and land on my hip, the body will adapt by shifting the neck forward, which sounds totally counterintuitive because now we're gonna fall which way? Forward, right? But to counter that, which way do we bend? Back, right. So now what we've done is we've taken pressure off the low back, we've unloaded the discs, and the musculature isn't tight anymore, right? So that's a great way of your body adapting, which works short term, but then long term, it creates a lot of problems. And then some of those problems are joint adhesions, or joint and muscle adhesions. Uh, surgery, obviously, has a fairly low success rate. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then, uh, what does this mean? Nobody talks to each other. What does that mean? So, your primary and your ortho and your physical therapist often, you know how we all communicate? You guys ever seen those little uh, reports that, that get sent into your file? If you ever open your file, you say, oh, wow, I got a little report in here, what is that? Oh, it's a half page note from you know, my, my PT. Well, those things come through, trust me, we generate them, we give them to the primary, we give them to everybody too, so they have them, but it's, um, it's not a great way of communicating. So what we do to, to try to make it so that we can get live, um, live changes are at the beginning of each day, we sit down with every patient's file that's coming in that day. And it might be 30 files, but that's okay. We just there go through each one. It takes about one minute per file, but if we can do that, then I know what's happening with medical. Medical knows what's happening with Cairo, and we both know what's happening with rehab, so we're all on the same page. But what that does is if somebody's having a problem one day, we can remedy it the next. And so it helps us get better, quicker results. Now, this is obviously a lumbar surgery here. What's the most common complication that might come from that? Paralysis. Yeah, paralysis. Is that right? No, death, yeah, that would be the most devastating. But yeah, most common though, probably infection, right? So, uh, so anyhow, this sort of thing is um, is more common than you think. Uh, not infection, but just post-operative complications come to between 30 and 40 percent. Bill back surgery syndrome actually has its own diagnosis. It's so common. Um, it's actually I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll let you spout. Just don't raise your hand. Just spout a number out. On a um, on a, a one to hundred percentile, Ohio Workers Comp Bureau did a they compiled a bunch of data over like the last decade. And they found that an unusually high number of patients that had surgery couldn't go back to work within five years, and that was deemed failed back surgery. 
What percentage do you think that was of 1 to 100? 20. 20. I, I figured 33 and a third, but I figured about a third. 50. So 74, kind of right around what you guys are saying towards the end. 74 percent, believe it or not, will fail back surgery patients. And so what that did is that revamped workers' comp in Ohio. And since that study's come out, it's kind of been adapted throughout the country. It's changing the work comp. So now people have to go through more conservative methods. Um, even though sometimes the conservative methods are just you know, injections to help control their pain, but at least they're not getting cut on as early. So back surgery versus knee surgery, uh, low success rate, fairly high success rate. And then uh, just by show of hands, anybody know anyone who's had failed back surgery? So, yeah, okay, so a couple of you. Takes up about 20% of our practice, believe it or not. Um, I had somebody come in Friday that had both uh, failed neck and back surgery, believe it or not. So it's, uh, it's shockingly common. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the spine here. So we've got vertebrae in the neck, mid back, and low back that all have these curves. And they have those curves for a reason. So those curves are in place to maintain the integrity of the joint. If, and, and really also, it's also to, to maintain the spine and the, and the, the spinal cord. I if you guys can see that yellow thing that's down there kind of between the vertebrae, but that's supposed to be the spinal cord. And then all these little yellow things that come off to the side, these are supposed to be the spinal nerves. Well, those curves are there for a reason, and that's to keep um, slack in the cord so it's not being pulled or stretched. When somebody has a curve, it's kind of like taking a banana. If you straighten it up a, a banana, it's gonna kind of mush what's on the inside. The same thing happens with the cord, whether it be in the neck or the low back. If you straighten up the spine, it can put tension on the spinal cord. And I'll give you a hint. Spinal cord does not like the stretch. So um, and if, it, if it does, it, it, it causes, as somebody mentioned earlier, it can cause paralysis or numbness or tingling. Here's what, probably the best example I'd say with the neck is if you ever fall asleep on your side, like on the couch, and you're not on the, the headrest and your neck's flopped over, and then this arm, because your whole brachial plexus gets stretched, the whole arm goes numb. So what happens when you sit up? The numbness goes away and changes to what? Tingling. tingling, tingling first. Yeah, you'll get that tingling. So tingling and and numbness are a bit different. If you pinch this nerve just a little bit, you'll get tingling. If you pinch it more, you'll get numbness. And then if you pinch it a lot, you'll get pain. And then there's varying degrees of pain, right? There's achy pain, feels like you, um, you have, what do you call that pain down the leg? Sciatica. sciatica. Awesome, good, nobody pronounced the C in sciatica, that's good. Um, if you have a little bit of, of, I can't say a little bit, if you have moderate pressure on the nerve, you get an achiness in the leg. It feels like you worked out with just that leg only. Um, if you have severe compression on the nerve, you'll get a burning sensation. You ever hit your funny bone and get not just a little zing, but a really big zing? That's what people that have sciatica feel like um, sometimes. I've never had that sort of pain, but uh, I know it can be pretty debilitating. So your curves, have specific measurements that they're supposed to be, and that's to maintain the integrity of the spine. So I'll give you a, a, a quick quiz here. How many, uh, and it was on the last slide, so for anybody that was a, a, a quick reader, how many spinal vertebrae do you have? 22. What's that? 24. You sure? Let's pay attention All here. of them. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> it, the, the correct answer is 24, unless you're Lincoln. I thought that was great, so I'll, I'll cut that one off. But uh, I, I play that one. You know that little 30 second rewind button on your remote control? My wife gets mad. She's like, stop doing that. I'll play it over and over again. So, um, all right, so we'll skip that one. But let's talk a little bit about, um, about the nervous system. If you look at the, the brain and the spinal cord, the brain and spinal cord make up the central nervous system, right? And then all these nerves out to the side. So that's the, the, the pink part and the red part here. And then all these blue nerves that come out to the side are called peripheral nerves, right? So that's the peripheral nervous system. I'm not saying one's more important than the other, but the central nervous system is more important. So if you had damage, you wouldn't want it to be to the central nervous system, you'd want it to be the peripheral. And you can have varying degrees of damage. Like let's say uh, 
this nerve right here before it got out to the heart. If we put a clamp on that nerve and shut that nerve down, what's going to happen to the heart? It's going to quit. Yeah, right, sure. Maybe mild, uh, mild compression would cause heart palpitations or something more severe would cause uh, you know, shortness of breath where, or, or maybe uh, pooling in your legs where your body doesn't have good circulation. Well, those same nerves that go to your heart and your lungs also supply the mid back. So I get people with back pain between the shoulder blades. And that's because they've got, uh, you know, let's say misalignment or compression on the nerve, or they had a fall, they injured themselves. They often get heart palpitations or shortness of breath. Um, I've had a lot of people that have pain in this area, in the low back, and they'll get pain down the leg. Now, I know we're all eating, so we probably won't talk about all of this, but you, know, you can have bowel and bladder malfunction, and it can cause issues over time that uh, will make it difficult for you to relieve yourself, let's say. So those things are all reliant on the nervous system getting the messages out and supplying those organs with what they need. So when we look at the spine, you can see how this guy is straight at the top but has a curve at the bottom. This is a before and this is an after. Obviously, we're trying to get everybody as straight as possible, and that's our goal. But that sort of alignment doesn't look like a whole lot on an x-ray, but in reality, that's pretty huge. It's, it's the, it can put a lot of compression on the nerves and where it puts pressure is on the concave side. So if somebody comes in and they've got to shift to the side like this, these nerves over here on the concave side are going to get compressed. These nerves on the other side have extra room to exit, so they're happy as can be. So that's what we have to look for, and that's why x-ray is so important, because it helps us take care of the patient. And where do we, what area of the spine has more damage than any other area on average? Lumbar. Lumbar, yeah, right, low back, exactly. So that's, uh, yeah, that's th this area down here that's, that's in purple. And the reasoning is simply because there's so much compressive force on that part of the low back compared to uh, anything else. I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, look at your neck, look at your mid-back, your mid-back especially. If, uh, if I get people that get thrown around, you know, somebody falls off a roof, it's, it's seldom that they, uh, that they, into their mid back. It's always their neck or their low back because your rib back has these ribs, right? And that holds everything together. Um, I heard somebody say, oh my God, you know, falling off the roof. Trust me, throughout the, I've had so many people fall off roofs. I've had uh, two people that fell, both of them were telephone pole workers, linemen, I guess, and they fell thir about 30 feet. Um, wow. So uh, one guy miraculously just, I think he broke his foot and that was it. It was surprising. But, we have to think of how much pressure is on these discs and these vertebrae. So if we're overweight or if we have bad posture, those two things compress. If we look at sports, gymnastics is a no-no, weightlifting, weightlifting to a degree, you know, I mean heavy weightlifting is, uh, is hard on the body. Golf, better see a pattern here, right? Any golfers, so, uh, just kidding. But, uh, but golf is a very unnatural motion, it, you know, that, that swing is like lifting and twisting. It's like picking up a box and twisting it. When I was in chiropractic school, uh, UPS was a popular place for a lot of us to work. I, I didn't work there myself because I thought, yeah, I couldn't do that to myself, but I'd say probably about four of my buddies worked there and two of them hurt themselves while they were there. And that was because they were doing so much lifting and twisting. So this is that sciatic nerve like we talked about. Longest nerve in the body, biggest, um, you know, most uh, broad, circumference nerve in the body. This is a top-down view of the vertebrae, so if you're looking straight down, instead of from the side, you're looking straight down at it like this. That center part here is the nucleus, and that can push out, causing a bulge in the disc, or in the annulus. And what that will look like from the side, if we get an MRI, is you'll see the disc pushing pressure back into the cord here, into that patriotic spinal cord. Here. So let's talk a little bit about anatomy because I know that's why you guys all came here, right? Everybody's excited. Okay, no, no, nobody's excited about this. This is what floats my boat, but um, let's talk about the, the disc. Most people don't think of the disc as more than pillars. They think, oh, it's just uh, it's a cushion between the vertebrae. The disc is so much more than that. What it does is it not only provides some sort of compressive uh, reaction, but it also allows for movement. So if I'm bending to the sides like this, it's because my discs are allowing that motion to occur. You've got two parts. You've got the inner part called the annulus, and that's, uh, I'm sorry, the nucleus here, the, the darker spot, and that's on this, is kind of like the, the pink part in the middle. 
And then the gray part on the outside is the annular fibers. And the annular fibers are kind of like, um, if you ever skidded your bike when you were a kid, you skidded it too much, or if you're like me and you didn't pay attention when you're changing your oil and you looked at your tire and you go, oh my gosh, those are threads coming through. That's not a good thing, but, um, but those threads are in a, a pattern, right, in, in, in a tire, and they keep the tire from bursting. Well, your annular fibers run circular, circumferentially, kind of like looking at the, a tree stump where you can see all those rings it's the same way, and those do a fantastic job at containing the nucleus in the center. But what they do is sometimes they can weaken, and they can allow little fissures to form, like this little gap right here or out here, and those weak spots can be exploited from damage, from pressure. You slip uh, on the ground and you, you, uh, your feet come out from under you, you land on your butt, all that compressive force pushes into your low back and your discs get a rude awakening and that's what can cause disc issues through here. <coughs> Those issues can look kind of like this. The, the purple, let me look at the blown up part. So they are obviously blew this part up. The, Blue part in the center is now the, the, the nucleus, and the purple part is the annulus. The nucleus can work its way all the way out, uh, kind of like if you can see on, on this guy here. Can you make out this thing that squirts out the side? That should not be there. That's, that's a, uh, what they call a herniation, right? The difference between that and this is this is just a bulge where it tends to, to, to bulge out on the sides where it looks like a, a hamburger that's too big for the bun compared to normal, right? So the, um, the bulges and herniations are both, can be, can be, they can be devastating, they can also not present with any pain. I've had people come in with herniations, had zero pain. I've had other people that had a mild bulge, but it was in the, just the, the perfect spot to put compression on the nerve or on the cord, and then they get a lot of discomfort out of it. So when we look at what can occur from these bulges and herniations, you can get low back pain, you can get weakness, pain, tingling, numbness into the legs and feet. Um, I've had patients, this isn't very reassuring, but uh, I've had patients say they can't feel anything on the bottom of their feet. They know how they're accelerating when they drive, uh, how well they sink into the seat. And that's how they gauge how they're stopping too. And I thought, boy, that's not a really safe way to drive home. You probably should have your spouse driving next time. But, but anyhow, so, in severe cases of low back problems, you can develop bowel, bladder, uh, sexual dysfunction. Those things are all real. And people, it's very odd, it's the, it's sexual. I had a guy come in to me. Uh, we moved offices about probably three and a half, four years ago. And before, when I was, I was in West Bradenton before, this guy used to come in about maybe once every, I don't know, probably six or, or so months. And it was because everything wasn't functioning right. And I thought, eh, I've never had anybody come in for that, you know? But, I understand the concept as it goes to those nerves, so we we work on him, and the guy would be fine. I work on his back, and he would be fine. Just want to clarify that. Uh, <laughs> most of the time, he'd be fine. One time it didn't work. He came in the next day, and he was upset. So I said, "Hey, man, I won't charge you, but we'll just do the same thing again." So, um, anyhow, never got my thing twisted like that before. But uh, so, let's talk a little bit about what a herniation does. This is an MRI, right? So in an MRI, especially what they call a T2-weighted MRI, the water is white. So what's this stuff that runs back? What's, what's that fluid that runs? Spinal fluid. Spinal, spinal fluid. fluid, exactly, yeah. So CSF is that spinal uh, fluid that runs right around the spinal cord, and it's, it's encased, and so it, it circulates, right? You've got your sacrum down there at the bottom. Your sacrum is this fusion of bones down here that sacrum as you walk it pumps up and down and that's what what helps circulate CSF up to your brain around your brain and then back down so it keeps everything moving and so your CSF is what provides nutrients to uh, not just your brain but to your, your spinal cord and everything as well and so it's got to make sure it can get through how much blockage is here can you see where that big red arrow is that disc has put a lot of pressure back there where the, where the nerves are. And unfortunately, it, that's such a huge one. This guy would be sent out for surgery if he presented. Now, when we look at normal discs, see how this one's white? Just like CSF is white, your, your discs should have some whiteness to them because they're mainly water. They should be about 86% fluid or water. Same thing here, same thing here. You can see these have these tiny little bulges and those are normal, that's not a bulge. But your discs should have a, a little bit of um, edge to them, some roundedness. 
When we get down here, this is obviously very different than what's happening up high. Let's go through this. So four pillars are uh, obviously decreasing pain and inflammation, trying to uh, take the structure and get better alignment out of it, and then stabilizing that structure to keep it in that alignment. And then fourth, we talk a little bit about regenerative medicine, because people often come in and they say, well, you know, what can I do to speed things along and get faster results? But what is the first thing we have to do right that we have to figure out on the exam? Let's say we do exam, we do x-rays, we find out something to be able to treat you. We have to get the correct what? Diagnosis, exactly, yes, yes that is it. Without that, that correct diagnosis, we're barking up the wrong tree, which almost all the time we get the wrong uh, results and we won't get the remedy, we won't remedy the problem. So sacroiliac joints are, we call it the SI joint for, well, I guess that's the S and that's the I for short, but um, the SI joints aren't really visible on that. You have to see it from the, from the front. So that's where this crack is. Can you see just above my finger, there's that, that crack or that joint in the pelvis. So that's where your sacrum, this fusion of bones that we talked about, that triangular shaped bone, meets your ilium or your pelvis. And that's what allows for movement. So in, in a female, as the birth process occurs, these joints open up. And that's why your, their body uh, creates more elastin. So they, they've got the ability to open up those joints. It's an amazing you know, process that can even happen. But when we have somebody come in with back pain, it often is from this. It's from the SI joints. And the reason you know that is because when you take the x-ray, you look for these little red squiggles. They're always there, I promise. And you know that that's where it's coming from. Just kidding about the promise. But, um, so, so the SI joint is a commonly missed diagnosis. Here's another one. The set syndrome is where, see how this joint, this vertebrae comes down here, and this one comes up here, and they meet in the middle? That's this joint in the back of the vertebrae, right, right here where I've got the pen. Right? That, that joint is called your facet joint, and that facet joint allows for motion. In this case, you can see how that person is bending, they're bending forward and back. And as you bend forward and back, they become what they call open and then closed packed. And closed packed is the most stable position to be in. However, it can irritate the joint as well. It can cause, um, it can cause facet syndrome by being compressed. And over time, that pressure causes a buildup of, uh, of the inflammatory process and we get stretching and there's like a little, um, you will follow a semi truck and you see those the, the shocks in the back there like airbags. You get the same thing around each joint. You got a little joint capsule. And when that becomes inflamed, it causes pain. There's stretch receptors in that. Your body perceives that as pain. So if we look at this guy, you can see how this guy looks great at the top, and then you get down here, and then what are these things growing on the front? Bone spurs, yeah, exactly. It's kind of hard to see from the back, I think, because I've got this on a white background. But but those bone spurs are little pieces of bone that have protruded out. And what those do is, is limit your range of motion and they can cause some discomfort in the area too, especially if they're bad enough where they're getting close to touching. So this is another example of somebody that's got good vertebrae at the top and then they've got something down here. What do we call that one? Almost called a spondylolisthesis. I know you guys were thinking that, right? Yeah, I know, I know. I know, yeah, right, right, it's almost there. So, um, so, and here's a tongue twister. So if you have a fracture back at the pars, and the pars is this part of the bone right, right here, the part that comes off the back. If there's a pars fracture, they call it a spondylolytic spondylolisthesis. And I thought, who came up with that idea? So I don't know where that guy would genetically be from. Um, if he named it after his last name, but I, I doubt that's the case. So, all right, what does this look like is about to happen here? Yeah, but it's about to totally pop. I mean, that's a, a bad herniation right there. That thing is working its way all the way out. The nucleus is almost, uh, what, what they call non-contained is when it pops, when it actually uh, extrudes out the side of the disc. And so that's, um, I would say, a, a bad situation to be in. That will cause severe pain. And then those people often are, um, you know, they have to run through a, a whole regimen of treatment to fix that. Now, the piriformis muscle is a muscle that connects your sacrum again to your hip and allows for, for hip rotation. But what it does is if it becomes inflamed, inflammation means it, it becomes a, a little bit bigger, right? There's more fluid in there, it becomes a little bit larger. It can trap the nerve between the pelvis and that muscle. 
See how this is an axial view of that nerve? And the muscle has become larger and puts pressure on that nerve and pushes it into the bone. So that also, piriformis will, will mimic uh, low back pain and sciatica, actually it does cause sciatica, but um, people think it's coming from their low back where in reality it's a muscular problem, which um, I, I think, I, gosh, I probably missed that thing for the first six months of practice until I figured it out. Um, it's, it was really hard for me at the time to diagnose, but once you figure it out after a while, um, it's, it actually becomes pretty easy. And part of the reason we know it's that is because the person jumps off the table when I put my thumb in the wrong place. And uh, they say, boy, that's, it, it just kills, it really hurts. But um, it also gets remedied, I, I can't say remedy, it's probably not the best word. Uh, you can calm it down about 80% in five minutes with doing a simple trigger point injection. You can really make a big difference. Uh, the, the muscle will calm down and then the inflammation goes away and the pain subsides a bit. So adaptation is what we are great at, right? Our body is, uh, is always changing under stress. So remember we talked earlier about you know, having issues and leaning back and, and changing over time. That posture over time causes this. It's called lower cross syndrome down here at the bottom. And two physiatrists or MDs that study muscles came up with this term. It was uh, Vladimir Yanda and Rene Callier. Actually, Callier gets developed it and then Yanda expanded on it. But what he said was when the body has weak abs and weak glutes, that forms a cross. And then the other cross is formed by, instead of uh, placidity, placidity or uh, hypotonicity, too, too little tension, they have hypotonicity in the opposite. So in your hip flexor that lifts your leg, right, your psoas muscle, and then your lumbar muscles become really tight, and your body can compensate for that. But now I've got weakness here and here, tightness here and here, this is gonna contract, right? And so I'm going to pull the, the front, imagine I've got like a saucer, I don't really have, um, all right, this is the best saucer I can, I can do, but if I have, muscles, I have weak abs pulling up and strong muscles in my hip pulling down, my pelvis is gonna shift forward, right? I have tight muscles in the back pulling up and weak glutes pulling down, my pelvis again is going to shift forward. So that process causes people to, to get more curvature than they should and then as that happens, they compress those facet joints in the low back and that's a major cause for facet syndrome like we had talked about earlier. So let's talk a little bit about posture because I know everybody's looking really good here. Nobody's slouching at all. Just to make a quick observation here. Um, so, just joking. Uh, so this guy has 100% of normal disc pressure on his spine. We're saying we stand, right? Just normal disc pressure. At that point, we've got a great curve in the low back. Oh, this way, this way, yeah. All right, so we've got a good curve in the low back when we stand. What happens to that curve when we sit? gone, right? Flattens it out completely because we now have to pull our legs. Now this spine doesn't really bend very well, but what we used to think is we used to think that we had 90 degrees of range of motion in our hips. The reality is we don't. 60% come from the hip, 30% come from the back flattening out. So if I sit down in a chair, which I don't really have up here, but um, if I were to sit down in a chair, my back curve would flatten out or reverse slightly. And that's why sitting, if you've got a bulge or a herniation, is so hard on the spine. And that's simply because you go from 100% of disc pressure to 140, so you tack on an additional 40%. And that's hard on the spine, actually hard on the discs. So, and that's from sitting in a 90 degree chair. What happens if you bend forward? Look at that. <coughs> it's much worse. You've almost doubled your disc pressure by bending forward. And so that sort of position uh, can wreak havoc on the low back. And this, this position in itself is why people that have disc issues find that if they can crank up their lumbar support in their car, they can drive farther. They feel better because they've got compression. They've got um, more curvature in their spine. So if you're going on a long trip and you've got back pain, make sure you bring a lumbar support with you or a towel at least or something. Now, let's talk about, oh, I love this one. This one's good. Okay, so Nachlinson. This guy was the friend. These guys are magicians, evidently. They were very, very persuasive. They persuaded some guy, not the smartest guy, to put a pressure sensor in their, in their L2 disc and then go through all sorts of ranges of motion. I don't know anybody, I, I could never convince a patient to let me do something silly like that. But these guys did it, I don't know what they were paid, but anyhow, what they found was as they ran these guys through different ranges of motion, they came up with virtually the same 
uh, results throughout. They found that that 100% of normal disc pressure is standing, and then when you compare that to sitting, like we talked about, it goes up uh, a decent percent. And then when we look at standing and holding something, that's when it gets real. I'll tell you my quick story. You see how this is about, I don't know, maybe 450% or close to it? What uh, I hurt myself that time in the gym, and I forget, you know, you, you make a mistake once, shame on you, you do it again, or maybe it's not. You know, you know the phrase I was trying to get to, but, uh, so I was at this uh, this pool party. There's 22 kids in the pool, right? And and I'm kind of a, a safety freak, so I'm overseeing all these kids, thinking this is dangerous, you know. And it's not my pool; it's uh, somebody else's. We, we went to a birthday party, and they're all eight years old. So of course, do kids at eight years old run around the pool? Absolutely. I'm like, stop running. Two minutes later, stop running. They're running around, and on the back side of this pool, there's a screen. But between the pool and the screen, they've got this little basketball hoop, and it's sitting there on this little plastic thing. And I thought, and so the kids are just jumping over it and running around the pool and jumping over it. So I think, oh, I'm going to go take it out of the way. I go pick this thing up. I get about halfway up. It was, it was plastic, I promise, but it was filled with water, and I didn't know that. So. I, it was probably about 75 pounds. I got like halfway up and I was like, I'm not gonna hurt myself again. So I just kinda, there's all these parents looking at me too, so I just kinda shimmied off to the side because I didn't wanna look like a ton of wet and set it down, you know? But, uh, but the reality was, I was afraid to lift the darn thing because it was brutally heavy. And I did hurt myself, but, um, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Now, the reason that's a bad, a, a bad position is this thing was long, it was like about three foot long, and so the water was, was throughout the whole thing. I'm lifting it out here, and so this distance between here and, and the front of it was, you know, I pulled it up to, to, so it was resting on my legs to be able to move it. So it's about maybe 20 inches from my spine, right? And your spine has muscle on the backside, right? This muscle back here contracts when I go to straighten up, right? But that muscle runs in these grooves. See how there's like a little groove on each side? So it's really close to the spine. The pivot point, the center of your, your range of motion is that nucleus that we talked about, right in the center of the disc. So biomechanically, that's where the pivot point is, like the hinge, let's say. So if my muscles are, I don't know, two inches back behind my spine, and I've got 75 pounds out 20 inches, so that's like a 20 to two or a 10 to one ratio. This thing I swear was about 75 pounds. What am I contracting back here to straighten up? 75 times 10, right? 750 pounds of force. People don't think that their back is strong. Even if you're, if you're prone to injury, your back is extremely strong. Um, it, to be able to pull that kind of force is, is amazing. And we all have that ability. So, well, just not a pool party. That's incidentally, it didn't work for me. I used to have that ability. So, so this is a terrible position to be in. And, and that's why you see these weightlifters on, uh, you know, in, in the Olympics and they've got talcum powder, so they slide and they lift those big heavy weights and they bring it right next to their chest and push it up because yeah. they're trying to keep it close to their body. Right. So the farther out, it just gets wow. you know, exponentially heavier. So they try to avoid that. Now, for anybody, here's another takeaway. Anybody that's got disc issues, anybody here have a, a back, um, now let's say a bulge or a herniation or suspect they do? Okay, so, wow, okay, so a lot of us. All right, so let's cover this because I was thinking about skipping it. This is a good one to, to cover. So. Um, Normal, yeah, normal disc pressure was standing like we talked about. When you lay on your side, now, now Wilk and Nachwinson came up with differing uh, results here. Nachwinson said when you're on your side at night and sleeping on, on your side in the sideline position, you have 75% of disc pressure. And Wilk said, no, no, it's really closer to 30. But what they both agreed on was this, that when you're supine or on your back, you've got about 25% of normal disc pressure. And so you have, and I know there's a lot of people out there, I was one of them, that are stomach sleepers and cannot sleep in any other position, you've got to try to change. That's something that, that I, I can't stress enough. If you've got back pain, or even if you don't have back pain, you probably should switch. So sleeping on your back is the best position to be in, and some people can't do it because it hurts, so get a couple pillows and put it under your knees to take pressure and get some bend in your knees, and that does take pressure off the low back. But it's definitely the best position to be in for your longevity of your, your spine. Yeah. All right, and then let's go through this. Uh, pain reduction and, and inflammation. Now these things all have the same thing. They all have back pain, but it could be from fibromyalgia. It could be from spinal stenosis. Remember those bone spurs we looked at on the front of the vertebrae? If it happens on the back, 
you know, back here where these nerves exit, that's where that's when they call it stenosis. So stenosis is just a bone spur, or it's a uh, a bulging disc like this, where it comes out to the side, and it happens in the back where these nerves exit, and it makes that hole smaller. And that's all stenosis is: is shrinking of that hole, so the nerve can't get out as effectively. Then you can have osteoarthritis. Um, osteoarthritis, no, it's just uh, wear and tear arthritis, right? Not rheumatoid or psoriatic or anything. Um, bulges or herniations, and then you know muscular strains or, or ligamentous sprains. So those people all present with the same thing, and that's back pain. Unfortunately, they all have this too. They all have inflammation. Nobody would go doing this with a steel brush, but uh, <coughs> but inflammation is good and bad. Chronic systemic inflammation is bad. Local inflammation is good. It's what helps your body heal. So this person here is going to heal because of that inflammatory process, right? It's gonna bring uh, red blood cells, but more importantly, white blood cells in there to try to get rid of some of the debris and, and fight off infection. So it's very, very important. Knocking down inflammation is what we do with, with what? What's the oral thing that we take? Well, it, it, um, uh, I'm thinking more of like the, uh, like, 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 yeah, like an Advil or something like that. But those things, um, yeah, NSAIDs are, are good and bad. You know, I had, uh, I had a patient that had, uh, she had headaches, her best friend had headaches. The reason she came into me is because her, her best friend had gone to the hospital. She shut her kidneys down, believe it or not, because she was taking between 18 and 20 pills a day. And she was young, she was only 19. Well, she was 20 when she, <coughs> her best friend was 19, she was 20. And basically, um, she just thought she was invincible. She said, well, you know, I just figured, you know, the back of the bottle says you can take so much, but I'm, I'm pretty young, I can take more than that. Well, you know, obviously you can only do that for so long. I said, well, how long do you get away with it? She goes, oh, I don't know. I, we've been probably doing it for six or, or so weeks, but you can't do that for very long, and eventually your body shuts down. So, but I get multiple patients that come in to decrease pain, and they're taking NSAIDs. And what they don't know is when can they stop taking it, because nobody's ever told them that. And then long-term approach, not, not a great situation. Good short-term, just not long-term. Um, and then here are some easy alternatives that help. You can take turmeric, curcumin uh, for inflammation. You can take magnesium for nerve or muscle pain. Uh, both of those are very effective, and they just knock down uh, the process and help your body to just not experience that discomfort quite as much. And they're pretty cheap. I mean, goodness, I think even Costco sells uh, some of that stuff at this point. So, um, so different pain patterns can look like this. We get a lot of people that just come in with straight low back pain only. <coughs> this is what I get. I, I was getting in the low back, and three days later, it's all the way up to the shoulder blades, and it tends to stay in that area, uh, just on both sides, not one. And then I get other people that come in with pain in their SI joints or out to the, the QL muscles out to the side out here. And those are muscles that are uh, integral in, in uh, helping you bend to the side and supporting your spine. And those, uh, those muscles don't always hurt first, but they, they're pretty common. So we can do a local cortisone injection. It's a, it's a good option. It's not something I like to do, but it's something we do uh, when all else fails. Uh, we do a lot of trigger point injections. Those are, are probably more of a, a, a conservative approach. And when we use conservative approaches like that, we only, uh, and actually with trigger point injections, it's uh, marcaine and lidocaine. You guys know those are just numbing agents, right? There's no, um, I can't say there's no side effects. I mean, yeah, you, you can get side effects, um, but it's, it's few and far between. It's more of like a, a numbing agent that your body would um, just not feel pain for about two and a half hours with lidocaine, about, let's say, eight hours with marcaine. Um, we do a lot of diet and supplementation. Right now we're doing a weight loss challenge, which nobody <laughs> wants to hear when you're at a all you can eat buffet. Um, and then specific exercises. This is the most important. Save the best for last. We focus heavily on specific exercises to target the muscular deficits. And that is the most important thing. Yeah, core, right. So if you strengthen you know, certain muscles, let's say we've got weak low back, and we've got weak abs, or we've got low back tension, if we put some tension on our, our muscles in our abs, then we can take pressure off the low back. So we're distributing the weight, right? And so targeting those muscles is key. So we run everybody through a functional test and nobody wants to hear about it, but it, it, it really goes through a lot. It goes, um, it goes through all the major body muscles and it will identify if they're hypertonic or, or, or tense or if they're really weak and they need strengthening. 
I had this lady, she was a, she's a, um, what do you call it, a, a sports trainer, and she works out constantly. She's got really big shoulders, and I'm kind of jealous, but um, anyhow, we put her face down, and we had her lift her, her leg up. When she, when she did that, we, we put our, our, our hand on her glute muscle and her low back muscle, and the glute should fire first as she lifts that leg, and then the low back should fire second. Well, in hers, it was totally opposite. Her low back fired, and then, well, her glute never fired, actually. So we did it again on the mid back and again on the upper back. Every time, the back tightened, but there was no contraction in the muscle in the glutes. I thought, oh, that's really odd, you know? She looked like she was in great shape, but she had no, no glute uh, control. She just, she said, I use the butt blaster or whatever she <coughs> called it. Goes, I put my leg over that thing and, and push back and do it all the time. She goes, then I can't get, um, you know, muscle tone there. And that's really what her problem was. So we do this thing called stemming where we, um, we push on the muscle, we force it to contract, and eventually it wakes it up. And so it starts to work again. And in her situation, she responded really well, but hers was all because she had weakness in that area. I think I'm on the wrong slide for that one, but so I got off on a tangent. All right, come and bring in this one back. So, so SI joint injections, we utilize guidance. I mean, it's, if you've done a lot of them, you can do it without guidance. The problem is if you don't know you got it in the joint and you're, you're, you know, you're pushing that, that syringe down and you're trying to get an anesthetic into that joint, you can't really prove that you got it there, then you don't know 100% that you're getting the job done. So having the guidance is just some security. Helps us to know that we've done what we're supposed to do. And insurance requires it, I guess, too. So that's kind of the other important thing, right? Um, so let's talk about alignment here. We talk about feet. Everything's based on the foundation. So if our feet are off, our pelvis is going to be off. If our pelvis is off, then our shoulders are going to be off. And then the spine in the middle tends to bow to one side or the other because of that. And this isn't really how it typically works. Usually the, uh, the high shoulder and the high pelvis are on the same side. But our goal is to get you in this sort of alignment instead. All right, so the goal would be to eliminate symptoms, but the best long-term outcomes uh, occur by not just reducing symptoms, but by increasing function. By uh, function and structure, those are the two biggies. So we take a whole body approach to get that, and our goal is obviously to reduce the pain and inflammation, and then to reduce the weight that's on the structure. Now when I say weight, it doesn't mean that they have to do, every patient has to do weight loss by any stretch, but we wanna take pressure off that structure. So if somebody walks around, like I've got a couple people now that walk around like this, because if they straighten up, What's that? Yeah, bend over. Yeah, you ever see the, the people at Walmart? And, and, and uh, I shouldn't use Walmart as an example because then everybody's going to think of that. What's that website that people of Walmart or whatever? But I mean, like, uh, let's say Publix, and they, and they walk around, they're hunched forward yeah. because they've got facet syndrome and they have difficulty often straightening up. And so if they can slouch, they can get around the store and do all their shopping so they feel better. And that's a, a pretty common thing. But it's not just weight, it's, it's the alignment of that structure that's causing their problem. So all the weight loss in the world won't fix low back pain if it's not a weight issue. I've had multiple people say, oh, I lost 25 pounds because my, you know, my PCP said, Tim, you, you, know, you gotta lose that weight, you'll feel better, and that didn't change anything. So um, pretty common. So as we talked about, structure and function is important, but when we say function, that has a lot to do with increasing flexibility. What's the first thing football players do when they go out on the field before they start the game? Stretch. Exactly, stretch for, well, and then I'll, okay, so you guys got that one. I'll, I'll, I'll lull you into a um, false sense of security with the correct one there. Most people get this one wrong. Who gets injured? The, um, the car accident victim that is tense or the person that is just relaxed? The tense. Everybody, I know everybody thinks the tense one gets damaged more. It's totally opposite, I know. So, um, so here, I'll, I'll explain why. So if a football player is gonna hit a guy, he gets, he gets real solid, right? He, he tries to, to strengthen his, his shoulder and everything before he's gonna lay into him, or a hockey player or whoever. Um, otherwise, they'd be kind of throwing themselves around like you know, floppy fish. That would be kind of funny, but um, they'd sustain more injury. The reason that that whole thing came about, though, is because they talk about the, the drunk guy that hit somebody. Yeah. The drunk guy walks away from the accident because supposedly he was relaxed. Yeah. But they don't talk about the fact that he has you know, seven feet of hood between him and the guy that he hit broadside because he ran the stop sign of the red light or whatever, and that guy had all of, you know, eight inches of steel between him and, and, and the, the hood of that drunk guy's car. But that's really where it came from. So um, I'm not gonna get off on a tangent here, because I kind of already have, but uh, if you do ever get in the car accident, you see it coming, you look in your rearview mirror, push your head to the, the headrest, try to get, make your body as solid as possible, stand on that brake, 
don't let your car move because if your car doesn't move, he's sustaining more damage, more injury. So make your car immovable. And that's, you know, if you, if you were to hit a tank, that thing probably would move, what, two inches, right? And your car would be demolished. If the guy was inside the tank, he'd be in good shape. Sue, were you gonna ask yeah, a question? Yeah, a question. I know, no, I know, I'm just, I'm just ask sure that came to me. Does that mean, that same analogy mean for like boating, right? Boating anything. Anytime you're on any object doing anything, like if any, these guys are boating, same thing, should try to stabilize yourself. Oh, I thought you were gonna say hit the brakes. I was gonna say, I, I don't no, boat enough. No, 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 <laughs> but at least stabilize <laughs> yourself, right? Well, same thing. I'd imagine, yeah. Like in the water, it hit does, something. they're both, in yeah, water, you're still gonna cut, right? You're still gonna get the edge. Nobody's ever asked me that one, Sue. I know, that's I'm just first. wondering, well, let's, we can Google it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, well, let's check that one out. <laughs> Proper techniques to get in a boating accident. Yeah. All right, so, um, all right, so we, we do utilize cortisone periodically, as I mentioned. It's not a go-to, but um, we, we do use it every once in a while. The goal on, on cortisone is simply, and this is what frustrates me, a lot of people can come in and they get cortisone injections in their back or their knee, and they just get one every once in a while. They're not doing anything for it though, they're not doing, cortisone has one purpose, and that's to, um, to more or less stove you off so that you can do physical therapy, you can rehab the muscles. If you're not rehabbing and you're just getting the pain relief, then it's, uh, it's not fixing the problem, and that's, that's very frustrating, you see that all the time. Now proper joint glide is important, uh, and then flexibility and tendons uh, are really, really important at maintaining full range of motion. So you can see the difference between these muscles here and then these here, you can see how the one on top is moving and then this one has adhesions in it, right? So what do they call the, uh, when, when you, let's say you're preparing a chicken and that, that stuff that's over the outside of the muscle, what's that called? Fascia. Yeah, exactly, yeah, so the fascia uh, in, in our bodies can cause, uh, it can get adhesed or have adhesions, right? They call that, um, you know, uh, fascial adhesions. And so what that can cause though is it can cause the muscle not to be able to run through its full range of motion. So breaking up those adhesions allows it to function more like this instead of like this. And those are things that you can feel. You ever feel back in your muscles, like, like uh, you know, those trigger points are there or some of those adhesions, you go, oh my gosh, it's so painful. I just need a massage. But then you get the massage and then a week later it's right back. So those sort of repetitive things, that's when we do trigger points or trigger point injections. Now stabilization is key. So this exercise she's doing is for the glutes. And that's really good, specifically the glute medius. It's really good at stabilizing the, the muscles in the pelvis and the low back. <clears throat> this is a low back brace. There's a whole bunch of different kinds out there. Um, I do see a lot of people that have really bad back braces they picked up at CVS or Walgreens, and they, um, they're like the Home Depot braces. I don't know if you've been to Home Depot recently, but you ever notice that they don't wear much anymore? Everybody used to have to wear them. And the problem with them was that the ones that they were wearing were um, elastic, so they were stretchy. And so they would give them a false sense of security, so they'd go pick up something heavy, and they're likely to hurt themselves because they couldn't, uh, they felt like they were supported instead of not, you know, not lifting uh, quite as heavy as they ought to. These braces are really important. And I have a new slide here that I just put in uh, over the weekend, so I might mess this up. Uh, let's do this, let's go through a back Back pain study, they, they took these braces and put them on 900 participants, uh, rounded up actually, I think it was 867. But um, what they found was when they, rate, when they asked these people questions on, uh, and they sent them home with a survey and they had to fill out all these questions, they felt that some people felt immediate relief, some people felt it within 20 minutes, and some people within one hour, four hours, one day, and so forth. Some people it didn't help at all. Look, 89% of people got help, but 11% did not, and 2% even got worse. So I guess that'd be, you know, what, 13% it was not a good plan for. But these other people got results. Within one hour, 65%. It's amazing at, the, at how well the right back brace can help. And we've got a really good, um, we've got different kinds in the office, but we've got some really good ones that do a fantastic job um, you know, insurances like you know Blue Cross, Cigna, yeah. United, Medicare—they they cover that stuff. Mine was twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, some of them are like twelve. They're huge, yeah. and, and some of them are good, some of them are bad. You know, but you have to find one that works for you, and they um, they usually get good results. If we looked at this one here, you know, did did uh, you try the back brace in an attempt to avoid surgery? A lot of people say absolutely. You know, something I'm, I was trying, and then. Did that help them from having surgery? Not everybody, but some of them 
did, some of them just didn't know. And then there was that percentage that said, I still had to have the surgery anyway. It didn't really change much for me. But the vast majority of people get good results out of wearing it. And that's why it's so important. Now we're gonna cover a little bit about regenerative medicine. This isn't what everybody came out for, so I'm gonna keep this brief. If you were at home, Lowe's or Home Depot, this is not the board you're buying, right? You're gonna buy something that looks good like this. And that's because this looks better than that. Just like your spine, I wish your spine was on the outside of your body. Yeah. I, used to, I had this, uh, this guy when I was uh, 13 and I was in uh, eighth grade. He was uh, this, this Marine and he was my, uh, my uh, PE coach. And this guy was huge. He had, had his knee crushed, I guess, on, on a, a Navy boat. And so he walked with a stiff leg, but he was huge. And he used to say, um, we didn't have like sports in eighth grade. We, we, uh, we lifted weights every day and we ran around the track. It was like true boot camp, it was horrible. But, um, but he used to say that, um, oh, what was it? He had this funny phrase, but anyhow, he, he would always say, oh, it, I wish your heart was on the outside of your body where your bicep was. That's what he'd say, because your heart is more important. And then he'd say, Jay, get out there and run some laps. And I was like, awesome. So not excited for that. But, uh, but the spine is the same way. The, the, the spine can look pretty, we can't see it because it's inside. If it looks like this, let me tell you, there's a huge difference between the functioning of this guy with a big disc in the middle and this guy with hardly any disc space left. Huge difference. And this person's gonna have great flexibility and feel normal and be able to do the things they wanna do, but when that disc gets thinner like that, it starts really limiting what you can and can't do. And so this is a bone spur on the front. If it happened in the back, like we talked about earlier, that would be stenosis, right? So there's two kinds of stem cell. There's embryonic that comes from aborted fetal tissue that's not practiced here in, in the States anymore. That stopped, I guess, uh, with Bush, I think, 12 years back or so, 11, 12 years ago. And then mesenchymal stem cells are what everybody practices nowadays. And so uh, kind of how stem cell works is um, it, it helps your body to regenerate the areas that need it. Uh, years ago, you know, we're watching TV, we see some football player gets an ACL tear. This guy, you know, for all uh, medicinal purposes, that guy should have been out for, oh, I don't know what, you know, probably closer to eight to 12 weeks. Yeah. Instead, he's back in four. And you go, how can this guy be on the uh, playing field? He's so dedicated. Now nah, the guy's not dedicated. He went overseas, got stem cell because our country wasn't doing it anymore. And he, uh, he got his knee fixed. And so uh, they have to go through um, certain, certain um, parameters that they have to meet for that knee to be good enough to get back in the field. And so his ortho had to release him. And that's how they were doing it, it's because they're getting stem cell done. So as we talked about, it can become all sorts of different things. You can get it from bone marrow, from adipose or fat tissue. You can get it from umbilical cord. Uh, like I said, it's, it's uh, mesenchymal instead of embryonic, so there's not any ethical issues at this point. Let's talk a little bit about different types. There's, uh, there's some from the amnion. So the amnion is the placental side of the, uh, placental side, does that make any sense? The, the, the baby side of the placenta, right? And then the corian is the, the mommy side of the placenta. Uh, there is some cell, stem cell in that. The problem is they can't measure it. Uh, nobody's really been able to say how much there is there. Uh, so that's not a product that we would use. Uh, you can get it from adipose tissue. Uh, anybody would love to have some fat taken out and, <laughs> and replaced as stem cell. That would be fantastic. But um, the problem is uh, there's not many stem cells in that. And also it's uh, the FDA's kind of cracking down on this one right now. That's the one that, that is under uh, the most heat. And that's because when they mix it, they have to mix it with so many ingredients that it, um, it becomes uh, more than minimally manipulated. So it becomes a, a drug technically. So that's, uh, that's the other problem. So that's why the FDA is not real happy about that. Uh, and then bone marrow is another way. So bone marrow has been out for many decades. Uh, and then fat came out after a while, and then amnion came out, and then umbilical cord is probably the most recent. That's been out for quite a few years now, but that's uh, what the, the most recent uh, research has pointed towards Wharton's jelly, and that is in the lining of the cord. So the cord itself has this jelly within it, and in, in the wall of the cord, let's say, and that's what uh, pads everything, and it, it also is high in nutrients too, so sorry if I cough. <coughs> But what the Wharton's jelly does is it allows the, uh, the has more MSCs by far than anything else. Let me show you this next slide. This will show you the number of MSCs 
in, in the body, in one every 10,000 cells is a stem cell when we're first born. Look at how that drops down to one tenth of what it used to be here by the time we're a teen. By the time we need it, we're in our 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and so forth. It's way down to one fortieth of what it was or one two hundredth of what it was. So how many stem cells are we really gonna pull out of my adipose tissue or out of my pelvis? Not many. And those stem cells are old. It's not the same as getting something that's new and vibrant. And so that's why all the research has gone towards, and this isn't new, I mean the research has been pointing towards uh, the umbilical cord and, and wart and jelly for, for years now, but it just gets better results. Plus you don't have to go through this. So this probe goes down into the pelvis in this situation here. You can also take it from your shin or your tibia, uh, but they, they drill in there and then that probe goes inside and they withdraw some of the marrow and then they can re-inject that after it goes through uh, some processes. But the problem is when a stem cell gets introduced into the body, it goes wherever there's the most inflammatory enzyme. And you just have your pelvis drilled into, right? So does that make any sense? No, because you're creating harm that now the stem cells are going to try to migrate to and fix. But it's still, I can't say it's as common. There's not as many people. There's still, you know, some places doing it. It's just not as common as it used to be. So this person has had injection done in the knee. You can see the difference between the before and after x-rays. Now, does the knee here look as good as it did on the outside? The inside doesn't look like it did on the outside, right? It can't fix it like we're 18, but it can help. And so in this sort of situation, that guy functions a heck of a lot better than he did previously. Um, this is not that guy, but let me do this. Let me play his uh, testimony real quick. <coughs> That was in bad shape. In fall in 57, I came to Prestige after having some unbearable sciatic nerve pain down my right leg. I'd gone to see my regular family doctor. He prescribed some anti-inflammatory medication and pain medicine and really did nothing for me. Uh, after a few weeks of that failure, I found an advertisement for Prestige and came here. Um, limping in the front door, uh, I had to have someone drive me. Pain was so bad down my right leg, I couldn't stand for very long, put any pressure on my right leg. Uh, people had to drive me places, I couldn't even drive a car. I was miserable. When I came here, they tried some treatments that I've never experienced before. I've never had chiropractic care before. I always thought it was a little sketchy, and boy, was I wrong. Uh, the series of uh, visits I had here, 36 visits over three months, uh, pretty much made all of my problems go away. It was gradual. I had some treatments of decompression, chiropractic care, and supervised exercises, which I learned to perform for myself, and very gradually, but it seems uh, to have been a permanent solution to my problem. Uh, I don't know a lot about medicine, but what they did here really gave me my life back. I can drive now, I can have fun with my grandkids. I I'm gonna skip over the rest of that, but um, but anyhow, this guy was in such bad shape, he, uh, he couldn't get from the, uh, waiting room to the consultation room. Oh. So we had to put him in a, um, an office chair and slide him down the hallway. Um, he was in bad shape. So. No wheelchairs at your place? So, no, I know, I know, we didn't have a wheelchair, I know. We've got crutches, we've got walkers, we've got everything, but just, you know, no wheelchair at that time. So um, what I'm gonna do is go through this one other. Here, this guy's got shoulder issues. So you can see this right shoulder looks good. The humeral head, you know, you can see the top of the arm looks round, right? That roundness is normal. Do you see the difference between the right and the left? Yeah. Mm. So what's happening in the left? It's attaching. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's almost fusing together, you're right. And that's because there's so little space. Now this didn't happen overnight. This guy had multiple, um, he had years of issues. He had 20 years of pain in that, in that shoulder. And he, um, he had three surgeries, uh, multiple injuries to the shoulder. and. They were looking at doing what they call a, a reversal, where the instead of like the, the ball being on the on the arm and the socket being on the torso, it was going to be reversed the other way, and that was simply because there wasn't um, wasn't any other way of making it work. But unfortunately, the ortho said that said, well, you know, I got to tell you, he goes, Tim, you got about a 50-50 a success rate on that. There's so much damage to this, I'm not positive that it's going to work, and I'll do whatever you want to do. So he said, well, you know, let me look at some other avenues. He came in. Uh, decided to do stem cell. This guy can lift his arm straight up now. He can, he can, he can golf again, which I, I know I knock golf a lot, but I, that was important. He had golf for a couple years, you know? So now he can do all the things that he, he wasn't able to do previously. 
So um, what I would like to do is this. I'm gonna open it up to um, Q&A, but before I do that, let me see, is Sue out there, by the way? Yeah. Was, is she? Okay. Yeah. Could you do me a favor and just grab her? I'm gonna see what she wants to do. Okay. Um, typically what we'll do is at the, at the end, um, people have insurance and some people don't have insurance, but to break down the barriers of cost, if you wanna get checked out, uh, we'll do it for no charge. We'll, we'll just sit down with you, find out what you've got going on, if there's something we can help with, and that's great. Uh, if not, we'll try to get you to somebody that can. But if you've got an x-ray or an MRI or any of that information, bring it in. I'd love to sit down and see if it's something that we can help with. And imaging is fantastic to have. You don't have to have that stuff. I don't have an MRI center in my office, but I do have an x-ray unit, so if we need to do x-rays, we can get that done in all 10 minutes. Um, but seeing what's going on is, uh, is always helpful. So what I'll do is this. I'm gonna have Sue just chat with you guys. She'll probably come around and, uh, and just talk to each person and see what works for your schedule. But try to find a time that works. <laughs> Plan on being there for maybe 45 minutes or so to be able to see what's going on, and then we'll just go from there. So uh, what I'm gonna do though is I'm gonna let her know I'm gonna open up the Q&A. So sit tight for one second, I'll be right back. And actually what I might do is I'm gonna show this guy's testimony 